academy and all the other schools that followed Methodist Boys High School, Methodist Girls High School in 1879 to the first teacher training institution in Nigeria in St. Andrews College, Oyo in 1875. Coming down to the first community secondary school in Nigeria, Abeputa Grammar School in 1908, and in Jebu Ode Grammar School and Ibado Grammar School in 1930 before amalgamation. At amalgamation in 1914, Northern Nigeria came with amalgamation with two primary schools and 13 pupils. The Walter Miller School in Zaria had nine pupils and the Nasarawa School in Kano has five. Southern Nigeria came to amalgamation with 14 post-primary institutions in 1914. Fast forward, at independence in 1960, there were 882 secondary schools in Nigeria, out of which 841 were located in southern Nigeria and 41 in northern Nigeria. Of the 41 in northern Nigeria, only seven were offering West African school certificate examinations at that time. Fast forward to 2019, we had 75 private universities. Of these private universities, Northwest had a total of three, of one, and Northeast had two. The Islamic University in Kasina and the American University in Yola and the Christian University in Karaba. Three. Middle Belt has seven. Seven plus three, ten. Ten minus seventy-five, sixty-five. At that time, if us were on strike, and the permanent secretary comes to mind here, there were sixty-five universities working in southern Nigeria, and only ten in northern Nigeria. What has that to do with productivity? It's about productivity, productivity of Nigerians. You cannot have productivity unless there is solid education. Let me tell you that of the 75 universities, 65 universities that were located in southern Nigeria, 20 of them were in Ogun State alone. And we cannot boast of 20 quality secondary schools in the entire 19th state of Northern Nigeria. This is critical to productivity. This is critical to the future. So for me, the basis for productivity is based on quality education. And I want to appeal to those who want productivity in this country to pay attention to education that we should have legitimacy in education. What do I mean by legitimacy? Ordinarily in politics, legitimacy means that the right people are ruling and they are ruling rightly. Legitimacy in education means that the right people are learning and the right people are teaching. In this country today, the right people are not teaching and the right people are not learning. Unless we have the right people learning and the right people teaching, there will be no productivity and there will be no quality education on which productivity will rest. I am not the guest lecturer. I just want to sensitize you that at the basis of productivity is quality education. All these people here and all the directors and most of you here are products of quality education. Don't forget that you cannot give what you don't have. It is my pleasure and opportunity that I have you know, to stand before you and say a few words about this. I have other things and I have a prepared paper. But you see, there's very little you can see and read when you are 77. So, I will let you have a copy. Thank you very much.
I think my principal needs a better round of applause. Very brief, concise, but he has set the agenda for the discussion this morning. And we are glad that you are here, sir. If he didn't get anything, he has clamored for legitimacy in education. And he said something that my boss, the Director General, will always say, you cannot give what you don't have. I believe those words are strong words for us today in this occasion. Please, let's give him another round of applause. Thank you very much. Here present with us is the representative of the uh, NLC president, the National Labor Congress president, Honorable Comrade Uchena Ekwe. Please, can you make your way to the high table? The labor is 10 minutes that will be coming your way. We'll be looking at the position and agenda of productivity in Nigeria from the government. Speaker, Dr. Bender, um, very proud to have you here, sir. We have um, been neighbors while he was at the Federal Secretariat, and I was also occupying an office around that place. And we also happen to come from the same state. And just to tell you that from Adamawa, there's never a lazy person. We are proud of you and we believe that uh, we will get a lot of messages from you today.
that will help us towards productivity. The DG NPC, who is the chief boss, I want to thank you for your determination in this country.
ladies and gentlemen, the roles and structure of every national productivity organization, whether known as a center or institute, is determined by its national context, but can change over time owing to its economic and political status. The National Productivity Center here in Nigeria has over time adjusted itself to its national context over the years as it continues to gra gravitate towards the path of improvement. This center is very strategic and very unique. There has been a lot of clamor for wages increase across the economy. But one responsibility of this center is to ensure that this increase in productivity or increase in remuneration of the economically viable nation, it requires attitudinal changes and behavioral modification by all of us, which is a major strength of productivity initiatives. Let me also add that for most countries of the world, the establishment of national productivity organizations is a strategic move to improve the competitiveness and economic strength of the nation. The expectations of government and Nigerians on the National Productivity Center are therefore not different. This is reinforcing the need for us to impact the life of our people. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the present administration has taken various steps to build the capacity of the center to carry out her mandates very well. And we don't expect anything less than very well. The review of national policy on productivity, which has been done, the funding of core programs of the center, such as the Foundation Day Lecture and National Productivity Order of Merit. Among others, speaks of how important productivity is to Mr. President. There has also been enhancement of the budgetary allocation of this center because of its own strategic uh, importance to productivity in the country. The government understands the need to play crucial roles in macroeconomic structural changes, age technological changes, adaptation, invest more in research and development, improve the investment on infrastructure given our population, and create a national environment for productivity initiatives. Invest more on education and training, which are all needed for increase of the national levels of productivity. We will continue to give the National Productivity Center all the necessary support to ensure the realization of its mandate of ensuring a productive Nigeria. At the lecture today, I will challenge all participants, having listened very keenly, to also provide to the center the various things that they think will help them in their places of work to enhance their productivity. These are indices that will be incorporated in the activities of Dr. Peter Yerumatapa, please can we give him another round of applause for that wonderful keynote address and giving the center and other stakeholders assurance that the government remains committed to the cause of productivity movement in Nigeria. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to recognize some special dignitaries that just walked in to the occasion. 
the Deputy Co Marshal Victor Mwokolo, MTC, the Head Policy Research and Statistics, representing the Co Marshal. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. You can stand up for recognition. Thank you very much, sir. Also, we have the representative of the Trade Union Congress, TUC, here with us. They are uh, special partners. Please, can you rise up if you are here for recognition? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for coming. Thank you. Also, we have Engineer Zakios Adebayo Amiola, Controller, Head of Operations, FCT Fire Service, and other men of the fire service who walked in. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Just uh, some seconds ago, uh, Honorable Ibrahim Ablai Halims, representing Akba Omala Federal Constituency, walked into this occasion. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much for your presence. We appreciate you for accepting our invitation to be part of this program this morning. While we recognize other dignitaries here, please, we are all very special and we appreciate you for accepting to be part of this sixth Foundation Day Lecture. Please, you are doing amazing things. And like I said before, everyone here is part of the productivity family and together we can hope for a better productive nation. So please, can you help me give yourself a round of applause? Thank you very much. I appreciate every one of you. All right. Thank you so much for keeping in touch with what we are doing here. Thank you very much, members of the high table. At this point, in the next 40 to 50 minutes, We'll be having our lecture on productivity paradox, creating the pathway of growth and development. And it's very important because in this lecture, we will get to know and understand concerted efforts for productivity movement. We'll also get to know the imbalance, misconceptions, challenges, and how productivity will create the pathway for growth and development. And with us today is one of the best brains that Africa has produced. If you've not heard him speak before, I have on two occasions. He speaks with in-depth of knowledge and command of authority on what he knows and believes in. He's someone that has traveled far and wide and as read the Director General told us before that he is the former Director General of National Office for Tension Acquisition and Promotion, NOTAP. He also was a former Secretary to the State Government of Adamawa State. He is also grounded in agricultural engineering. He has worked in North Australia, schooled in the United Kingdom and traveled around the world. So he has an open perspective to the issues of productivity. This morning, please join me. Let's make welcome Engineer Dr. Omar Boba Binturi for his lecture. Please carry on, put our hands together for him. Let's make him feel welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Just a second. 
Ja, hat sich dann nicht gesehen. I'm sorry, it's part of productivity. <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, I have to thank um, the management of the National Productivity Center for probably getting approval from my PAMSEC. This is not just your PAMSEC, it's my PAMSEC too. It's my junior brother, he's my friend, my colleague for years and years and years. And now he is the chief civil servant. At the federal level. I also thank the ministers for ensuring that this is possible. And, uh, and one gentleman, I think his name is Hassan, he met me in my office and invited me. And I said to him, uh, I, would do, I don't give lectures anymore. I just come and give motivational speeches. And then he said, still, that is okay. So what you are going to hear uh, may be useful but it's just some motivational uh, speeches. I thank all my leaders here. Uh, my comrade, Aremu, is here. I've respected this man for a number of years. And all my leaders here, uh, I benefited from them. But anyway, I shall come and operate my computer a bit. Because this thing is not, doesn't seem to be working. I had a remote to run through the slides very, very quickly. Uh -huh. I'll do like... My name is Umar Bindel, and... Uh, oops, I thought it was working. I hate my picture being there for a long time. Can someone be pushing my, my key? Aisha, come and do it, please. I have my assistant over there. And you have to run very quickly because the slides are not too quick. Come to think of it, Mr. IT, is your cable long enough to come here? Can you bring it? Can you? Can I have my computer here? It's better for me. Sorry, uh, gentlemen. Aha. Uh -huh. No, it's okay. Once, 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 you can tell me. Put it. Sorry. So, um, I will run through this very, very quickly. When Hassan met me in my office, I should come and give this lecture and I said to him that do you have two hours he said no I said then go and look for another lecturer I need two hours to give my lectures he said why I said because this is my CV I am from Adama State I know the chairman has read out uh, the educational transcript of Nigeria 
but I'm sure if he, you allow him to stay longer, he will tell you that Adamawa through Gongola from Northeast will not take less in education. So, I'm an agricultural power and machinery engineer. What that means is I'm a mechanical engineer relevant to agriculture. So, and I have a bachelor's from University of Nairobi, master's and PhD from England. So, to a certain extent, you can assume I'm actually well educated. Now, I went to academia. I taught in universities for a very long time, but not too long. But I became a senior lecturer and I climbed to a position of associate professor. Therefore, I would waste your time as an academic. But I left, I joined industry. I realized that in industry, when you hear anybody saying that I'm from private sector, I'm in industry, if he is not management, he is not. You are just a worker. So I was working in industry, I realized that it will not take you too long unless you become management. So I quit. And then I became a civil servant. I ran through the chief, assistant director, deputy director, director, and all the acting firms. And so I know policy. I moved around as a director for, through, in fact, you cannot believe it, I was director of sports in this country. I hired Samsung Siasia when I was director. So, and then I shifted from the core civil service and became a public servant or a political appointee, DG Nota. Therefore, I had my entity, I had my budget, I had my staff, I can terrorize anybody if I like, and I can do anything, I can do and defend my budget. So I had a bit of experience there. Then, I landed in Adama State as a secretary to the government. I now started mixing with politicians. Actually, they said I would have been frustrated in three weeks. And every week, I became stronger and stronger because I now understood the problem of Nigeria. In fact, after my four years as secretary of the government, I felt qualified that to write a book, Nigeria will never develop unless, and then I'll put dot, 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 dot. You have to talk to me to know why. You know, so at the end of the day, now I ended up. So it's because of this CV that I don't know what to talk about other than just continue to work around as a scientist and also a policy maker. But then, after we were defeated in Adama State, our party lost. So I became a social entrepreneur. What that means is I just wanted to work just like the chairman said, recognize the value of education. If you want to know the value of education, come and talk to me, because I know how I started to end up with it. So I wanted to put all the resources and support I have, all my network, into educating children. So I bought this place in the middle of Yoda. I smashed it down, and I built this edifice with everything I had, all this. And in this edifice, I registered it as an NGO, and then I put up walls with chairs and computers. One of my halls has 120 computers. And in this, I take children. It's not a school, it is a knowledge center. All children of all type. I take 100 children every day, free of charge. And then they will have interaction with computers, and if you hit my child in my computer center, you will leave the center. I encourage all the young people in Yola to become volunteers. Come on, I don't have salary to pay, but you, if you want connectivity to the internet for your WhatsApp, for your Facebook, my center has internet. I will leave you to connect for free. But come and interact with my children positively. And I even used to go out and pick the out of school children, put them in my center, give them a little bit of hope so that they can feel that it's not a big deal to sit in a quality place with air conditioning and computers. And I saw that that was not the, the I annexed the next plot next to my center. I bought it and I prepared a sports space. And I had children play because I realized that unless you put the play and the educate, it doesn't work. And I can tell you, this eliminated me and refreshed me. And if you want to partner with me, talk to me after this lecture and we'll go ahead. You can establish this in your village. Anyway, so today we are going to talk about productivity paradox, creating the pathway of growth and development. If you Google the meaning of paradox, it's like confusion and, uh, you know, kele, as, as Nigerians would say. Now, to me, the tradition.
additional value chain for institutionalizing productivity that we can measure in any country has three levels. Because productivity is a result. And the first, if in your country you are not able to defeat absolute poverty, that a lot of your children cannot have access to basic education. Many women cannot have access to basic health care to deliver and go home well. A lot of people cannot drink clean water and they're susceptible to waterborne diseases. You have a productivity problem. And it is not just this. Even if you are able to conquer this, you have to go to the second level whereby you can give your people all the opportunities to lead a happy, safe and fulfilling life through giving them a skill, practical skill, that they can use to make things as jobs and get paid. And then, because you are working and getting a pay, your ethics in controlling yourself is, it becomes higher. And I have not seen any country where people are skilled and they have a job to do and they work for four to eight hours and they go home in the evening and then they eat their dinner and then they say now it's time to go and kill people or to go and destroy. I have not seen that country. So when you have this middle class big pool of people, then your safety and security and also your enjoyment will that bloom. Now it's just not only these two steps. The final step is that you have to push to ensure that your country emerge as a knowledge and learning society that can respond to any need, any time. Your institutions are good, your, 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 your employment is productive and vibrant, and so on and so on. And you see, there are evidences of countries that have gone through this. Chairman will tell you. I mean, he reeled out the statistics. I was shivering when I was hearing the statistics there. Every country went through that. And I can tell you, the countries that have been able to do this successfully, we ourselves, we call them developed countries. We like going to these countries because their roads are good, because they are productive. Their schools are good and very efficient because they are productive. And we call them the developed countries. And that is the aim of the whole thing. How did they manage to do this through these three value chains? You will notice that in these countries, their policies are evidence-based. They don't just do things anyhow. They don't go to Singapore and get the development plan of Singapore and that of Malaysia and change Singapore to Nigeria and then Malaysia to Nigeria, cut and paste, and then you don't have any evidence. These people, they research, they look at what they require, and it is the